from New York City for our viewers worldwide. A very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrell. There's a sheer defiance in these equity markets despite a 27 basis point ratchet higher in the bond markets. Equities are defiant. Come down to the open. It begins right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up in the show, investors brace for the next wave of Fed speak. Senate Republicans jeopardizing the latest U.S. border agreement. And DocuSign adds to the growing list of tech companies slashing jobs. We begin with the only issue, the big issue, the Fed staying on message. If we keep getting strong quantity numbers, that is to say jobs numbers, GDP numbers, growth numbers, while inflation goes down, in the conventional view, that's not really supposed to happen. So that would, we, we'd have to be entertaining the possibility that we're entering a period like the mid to late 90s where you had productivity growth faster than, than expected, faster than trend, and, th and that opens up some new possibilities. Traders walking back the hopes of a March rate cut, bracing for the next round of Fed officials to speak and continuing to push back. Is that the narrative? Mike McKee joins me now uh, on set. Mike, what do you think we get? We've got a raft of speech today. Well, it's kind of interesting, Manus, because yesterday Austin Goolsby was a little bit nebulous about whether they should cut in March or not. He wouldn't endorse the chairman's uh, talk. And here's why. Um, we're looking at this issue, as you can see, uh, job growth going up, inflation going down. It is, as Goolsby said, a kind of remarkable situation, and that does leave them perhaps options. But it also raises questions if job growth is going back up, where are we going to end up? Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed president, published an essay yesterday suggesting that it might be on the other side. Bad news. The constellation of data suggests to me the current stance of monetary policy may not be as tight as we would have assumed. And yesterday, we got the senior loan officer survey for the fourth quarter from the uh, Federal Reserve. And here's what it showed. It showed fewer banks are tightening credit standards, particularly uh, those who are tightening them just a little bit. And it showed loan demand starting to significantly rise. So are we seeing a slightly stronger economy that would give the Fed pause in March and maybe even May? Well, yesterday we had the odds of a May, uh, March rate move rather at about 15 percent. Today they're up to 20 percent. Some people just not letting go yet. Ahead of all this Fed speak, we'll see who lines up on what side. Indeed. Uh, let's see who kills off March and pushes May further into the long grass. Michael, thank you very much. Michael McKee uh, setting the agenda on FedSpeak for the day. Let's have that conversation. Monica Defend joins me from Amundi Institute uh, and Morgan Stanley's Dan Skelly. Uh, here we are. We've had hellish velocity in this bond market for the past two days. Um, 27 basis points, the biggest move since June 2022. Dan, let me bring it to you first of all. A healthy repricing? Yeah, we think it is. And frankly, the market was overly uh, optimistic and over its skis related to Fed cuts. I mean, you were basically expecting 100 percent chance on Jan 1 of March. Then that was a coin toss a few coin toss a few weeks ago. And now it's where it should be, which is a much slower or much lower probability based on the strong economic data as manifested in jobs and ISM new orders over the last week or so. So look, I think the reality is the market is moving towards near certainty, 100% of the middle of this year for Fed cuts, which is frankly where Ellen Zentner has been all along. Monica, good morning. How are you? I mean, they've got every reason, every reason under the sun. They've got a good jobs report. They've got Powell pushing back. They've got inflation behaving. They've got a strong economy. Good news, you're up 27 basis points. What does that mean to you? Uh, again, to me, it's just a reprising with the market that uh, overshoot in terms of expectation of cuts to the uh, next door. And it confirms our view that the cuts will come later 
Later for us means May, and then we can debate uh, on the size uh, of the cuts to, to come. But definitely, uh, as an economist, uh, is a moment where we are having uh, big headaches. As investors, we're just noticing that valuations today matters more than the economic backdrop. Here's the conundrum, isn't it? It's about debating, as Kashkari does, where the higher neutral rate is. But to both of you, I would ask you the question, Dan, you say at the heart is of the interest rate cycle. It's going to be higher than the last one, higher neutral case. I mean, what does that mean, living in a higher for longer? I don't think that this equity market... Uh, nor the bond market has really coalesced around a higher for longer new normal. What does that higher for longer new normal mean, Dan? If Goolsby's right and we're going back to the 1990s, that takes me to five bit at six in rates. Well, listen, I think higher for longer is, um, you know, frankly, a good thing in terms of rewarding uh, economic uh, prudence and, and efficiencies. When you think about the 08 to 20 cycle, we were in a very abnormal period, as we all know, in terms of zero rates and really very little investment on the part of the government, on the part of companies. Companies, as, as we recall, were doing financial engineering and buying back stock or, or doing other types of um, you know, financial measures. They were not investing for growth. And today you're seeing, like you mentioned, a very different environment. Despite growth, potentially slowing throughout this year and rates being cut throughout this year, the way we've said it is the resting heart rate for growth and real cost of capital is higher than that 08 to 20 period. And importantly, at the same time, you're seeing an investment cycle from the fiscal spending initiatives from the government reindustrializing the U.S., from companies investing in AI. And so there's a massive innovation cycle going on. So what does that mean? That means two things. First, you simply have to focus on those companies that have stronger balance sheets, higher quality free cash flows, wider moats. And you want to focus on the companies that are either benefiting Dan, from this. Dan, this that, that higher new normal, and this is what we need to try and grapple with. We're baying as a market for five to six rate cuts of 25 bips each. The market has accelerated in terms of risk. The question is, is whether risk is just too infused by this scale of rate cuts. And what is the new normal? I mean, is it 100 basis points lower from here in a no landing scenario? Uh, so our official case is for a soft landing this year, which is where Ellen has been for the last two years. And we're also seeing about uh, three cuts this year as well, starting in June. Uh, and so, look, it is that kind of disinflationary growth scenario. Now, the equity market, I'll just come back to the equity market, yep. is narrowing, right? Even the Magnificent Seven, the leadership group of last year, has become the Fab Four more recently. Uh, and you're seeing a lot more concentration in quality growth at a reasonable price, right? So we are seeing some narrowing inside the, the Magnificent Seven itself based on fundamentals, based on relative earnings revisions uh, and fundamental uh, economic updates. Mm -hmm. But we're also seeing other winning uh, sectors and themes as well. Uh, Monica, I, again, I look at the credit spreads. They are so tight. Equities, equities are just defiant in the face of the velocity of rates. How well behaved do you think credit is going to be? By the way, Snap are cutting jobs, tech are cutting jobs, big tech are cutting jobs. There are canaries plopping into the bottom of the cage as we speak. But with that in mind, credit remains unabashed and resilient. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, higher for longer doesn't mean higher forever. Uh, it is true that the credit market actually has not been hit that much by higher rate. If you look at the ISM on services, actually, uh, it looks like uh, companies have not been hit uh, by higher rates. If I look at profit generation, again, all positive but the LIBOR. So it means that moving forward, uh, we do expect uh, these financial uh, conditions to tighten a bit. And for example, when compared to consensus, our EPS projections are much lower. We are into the 6%, which is uh, placing on uh, historical uh, averages, uh, I would say. Having said that, uh, on the uh, investment grade, this is uh, what uh, we uh, recommend. Stay on the on the quality side, just because we see some pronounced slowdown uh, mm -hmm. kicking in in the second, third quarter of this year, and something has to give eventually. 
Do you, Monica, I'm, I'm actually going to lean into your, your European exposure and perhaps depth, uh, that differential between the US and Europe, when you look at the credit cycle uh, between the two, will there be more resilience in the US relative to the European narrative? Uh, for the time being, we still prefer uh, the European IG uh, versus the uh, US, but it was uh, really based on the idea uh, that the US slowdown would have been now, which is not the case eventually. No, it, it, it's not. Um, Dan, <laughs> let, let, Definitely let, not. No, well, let's see what the, let's see what the ECB actually does and, and how this play, how this plays out. I have a guest coming up who says that he just doesn't believe the data and he should be pounding the table. But more of that in a moment. Dan, 2024, you expect the market to go from a right tail surprise to a wider middle, and this means a higher chance of more normal 67% equity return with potential upside coming from quality active portfolios. Now, 6 to 7% is a more normalized return. Is that broad-based? Are you prepared to go for breadth to deliver the 6 to 7% equity return? Yeah, and so the, the genesis of the wider normal is simply a function of last year's right tail surprises in terms of massive fiscal upside, uh, the consumer still spending red hot. We don't think some of those red hot surprises are going to exist as much this year. And the other thing I would argue is, frankly, starting points matter, as our team has talked about quite a bit. Uh, we're at 20 times forward earnings. Uh, we know that Powell's going to be cutting at some point. Maybe it's not March, as we've discussed. Maybe it's closer to the middle of this year, as the market is 100 percent certain of. And so there's a lot of good news now in the price. So listen, the 6 to 7 percent return is just a function of earnings growth, right? If we can just hold our multiple at 20 and grow something like mid single digits this year, that's the index return. As I referenced, we think you can get active management returns in excess of that. Where are you going to see some of the upside surprise? We think it's still in some of the tech and select software enablers of productivity, right? Be more selective than last year, of course, given the starting point. But importantly, we also want to be positioned in some of the beneficiaries of tech diffusion and the users of AI. Where are we seeing those gains? Healthcare, industrials, and in select consumer business models. Monica, if I, I just return to you in terms of your outlook, the debate uh, we've just had Dan lay out their roadmap for rate cuts. We touched on Europe. The risk is this, is that Europe out punches the Fed in terms of size and timing of the rate cuts. Is that a built-in consensus now in the FX and in the equity and credit story? Is that already imbued in the prices in Europe? Mm, not necessarily, meaning that uh, in Europe, the bargaining on wages uh, is still on. And it will be uh, like this until the uh, end of March, uh, early April. So uh, this is why we don't think it would be appropriate uh, for the ECB uh, to, to act by then. Then still, uh, the economic situation uh, in the uh, euro area is much different from the uh, US, more flattish uh, growth with some uh, surprises to downside when it goes to Germany and on the upside from the uh, periphery. So. We have this call for uh, June uh, when it goes to uh, the ECB to start cutting. But I think really uh, the rationale and is different and the timing is not necessarily uh, one to the other related. Uh, Dan, let's just finish off. We've got Snapchat cutting uh, 8, 9, 10 percent of the workforce yesterday. DocuSign is cutting 6 percent of their workforce. Defending margins in tech in the MAG7, I know you say it turns into the Fab Four. Um, but are we going to see more of this incremental job cutting to defend margin in tech? Well, for the big platform, the, the biggest names, right, they went through their down cycle in labor a year and a half, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things have happened as a function of that. Part one is I think a lot of those workers who were maybe the eighth best engineer at a big tech company have now become fairly valuable or productive at a healthcare company or at a government agency, et cetera. There is so much demand for tech skills across the economy uh, that I think those folks are becoming reabsorbed in the economy very quickly. Part two is when you think about what happened to the uh, cost structures and the business models, you're seeing operating leverage. 
All right, so you're seeing a recovery in corporate IT spending in cloud and some of these other tools, AI of course, but you're seeing a recovery across the board and so on a lower cost base, those big platforms are now seeing some operating leverage and you saw that manifested in some of the earnings results last week. So listen, I don't think that some of the smaller companies uh, in terms of the aggregate matter that much. I think you really want to focus on the bigger companies. Okay. Let's see how the rest of this earnings season falls up. Monica Dufan, Dan Skelly uh, on the market. Joining us tonight to look under the hood, stocks moving ahead of the bell. It's Abigail Doodle. Well, Manus, we do have a relatively flat uh, surface for the futures, but beneath that surface, we do have some bigger movers to the downside. Tesla, these shares are down almost 2%. Actually, they're off the lows, down 1.4%. SAP has stopped offering Teslas as company cars to employees, similar to uh, rental companies Hertz and Six. They've also pulled Tesla uh, from their fleets. One reason being given are the price fluctuations. Eli Lilly, on the other hand, up 5.4%. They put up a 14% adjusted earnings beat, 4% sales beat. Their new weight loss drug, ZepBound, launched in December, brought in $176 million in that very short period. The 2020 forecast, not surprisingly, is better. And then finally, Palantir surging up 21%. The data company posted its first annual profit. They also gave a higher profit outlook. AI, the big driver, there's only a 5% short interest there. So there's a little bit of a squeeze, but not so much. It seems like there's some real buying power there, Manus. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing, the switch in the jobs from, from, from perhaps some cuts into the uh, recruiting the AI space. Abby, thank you very much. It's about rebalancing uh, the human capital element within tech. Coming up in the show, uh, President, uh, making his pitch to Congress. My next pitch, Speaker Johnson, is pay attention to what the Senate's doing. Everything in that bipartisan bill gives me control, gives us control, without being, and still meets the needs of the people being able to come around, legally come across. The latest developments on Capitol Hill is next on Bloomberg. My next speaker, Johnson, is pay attention to what the Senate's doing. We got a bipartisan deal. So you're going to see the detail of it this week. Everything in that bipartisan bill gives me control, gives us control, without being, and still meets the needs of the people being able to come around, legally come across, run open avenues of legality, and shut down the ones that are not coming through the points of entry. President Joe Biden trying to drum up support for the bipartisan Senate deal that would impose new U.S. border restrictions, provide billions of dollars in aid to Ukraine. Now, the House Speaker Mike Johnson had this to say, uh, and other GOP leaders giving the deal a thumbs down. Uh, the Speaker said they warned that a compromise deal was dead on arrival. Uh, the pre president, former President Trump saying a great gift for Democrats and a death wish for the Republican Party. So it is the long arm of Donald Trump, the former U.S. president. Joining me now is Bloomberg's Jonathan Tamari. Jonathan, I mean, we knew this was going to be dead on arrival in Congress, but the Senate turning, this, this sort of, you know, throws all the political cards up in the air. First take. Yeah, I mean, it was stunning to see the speed with which the opposition came out in the Senate. As you point out, the House had made their intentions clear, but there have been many senators, including Republicans, who had said that they wanted to see a compromise here, that they wanted border security linked to uh, foreign aid for Ukraine, Israel, and other American allies. And they seemed to get what they wanted with this deal, yet they came out very quickly against it. And that just kind of shows how the politics have shifted with Trump nearing the nomination to become the, the Republican nominee. Uh, that now they're rejecting exactly what they had asked for, and it le makes it leaves this huge question about what's going to happen with aid to Ukraine. It's hard to see what the path is at this moment to see how that can get through both chambers of Congress. Yeah, and that chasm opening up between the United States uh, financial support for Ukraine and the Europeans. We did take their time to get there, but they got there. This differential, differential will not be lost on Putin. Jonathan, thank you very much. Jonathan Tamari there. Uh, let's pivot to UBS. Share buybacks. They're everywhere in Europe. Uh, and today, it is UBS vowing to hand back as much as a billion dollars to shareholders in the second half. This is it seeks to move beyond the integration of Credit Suisse. CEO Sergio Motti spoke to Bloomberg's Francis Lacroix a little bit earlier. One thing that we need to do is to uh, 
be willing in the next couple of years to sacrifice a little bit of uh, top line growth in order to improve uh, the returns on our uh, of our uh, financial resources particularly on the balance sheet Let's get a little bit more with Steve Irons, uh, who's covering the UBS story. I mean, this is Armati talking about a prudent approach to share buybacks. I'm quite surprised the share buybacks are back as early as they are. That should have been a shot in the arm. What has been the detraction today in the UBS story? Well, yeah, I think you're right. The buybacks um, unveiling the now, that's actually positive news for investors. UBS is back uh, buying its own shares, or will be back uh, in the next half of the year. But there was a quarterly earnings miss. Net income was below estimates. Um, so I guess people are just um, expecting a little more. This poses questions about the future. The wealth management unit didn't perform as expected, which is the, the engine of uh, MRD's plan. And if that shows weakness, investors just ask, okay, what does it mean for the future? Yeah, well, certainly it's going to be interesting to see did they pick up any flow from Julius Burr uh, with the ructions that they've had down the street on Banhofstrasse, and maybe the market is unimpressed with these targets that they've set. Perhaps the benchmark just isn't as high as the market had hoped. Steve, thank you very much. Steve Ahrens, uh, great work as always on UBS and Deutsche Bank. Morning calls. This is what we've got for you. Academy's Peter Cheer joins me on why he is not convinced, not convinced the economy is about to take off. Doom and gloom, you got it in a couple of minutes. not be defied. That's essentially the message from the equity market. You might have job cuts uh, coming through from DocuSign yesterday from Snap, but these equity markets are robust in the face of a 27 basis point lift in 10-year government bond yields. Likewise, likewise at the short end of the curve. Uh, the breadth of the market is where you've got the laggards on the Russell 2000. Roll it over, have a look at the, the bond market, because this is where the potential spoiler alert comes. But at 445, you've got a pretty sizable offering of threes, tens, and thirties, uh, and a chunky 30 billion of corporate debt to come and hit the street this week. How will that be absorbed? Buyers of the world, unite. Let me give you your morning calls this Tuesday on Wall Street. The scribes say this. First up, uh, BTIG uh, downgrading McDonald's to neutral, anticipating a modest earnings growth amid a weakening in the consumer. Next up, UBS upgrades UPS to a buy, expecting management to deliver effective cost-cutting measures. And finally, Daiwa downgrades Tesla to neutral, growing increasing concern about the company's corporate governance. The stock is down 1.61%. Academy's Peter Cheer joins me in just a moment. We'll talk about rising bond yields. And he's not convinced on this economy. I love family days. Look at that. There you go. Bring your kids to the Nasdaq. Uh, it's a big day for, for a co-pilot. Uh, can, they, can they live up to the technology dream? Uh, a lot of tech job cuts out there coming down the pike. We'll talk more about Spotify in just a moment. For now, you have a resilient, robust equity market that is casting off the rise in yields. You have good technology reporting earnings. You have a sure defiance here. S&P 500 up by two tenths of one percent. Roll it over. Have a look at the rest of the markets and you begin to understand what's going on around the at uh, risk this morning, flat on the euro dollar. The dollar, of course, having made the highs against uh, multi currencies, the highest since November of last year. Yields ticked down by a pip. Don't get too emotional about that. You put on 27 basis points in the space of two years, the biggest two day run since 2022. Crude oil is up seven tenths of 1%. The story in crude is more about dividends, dividends and buybacks from BP, uh, Exxon, the gargantuan buybacks that you've got out there. Javier Blas's opinion uh, column is something to read, to understand to understand what's going on there. I mentioned Spotify at the open. It is one stock to watch, posting better than expected subscriber growth. And that's thankfully uh, a successful promotions campaign that went on and keeping the costs in check. Finger Beauty up 9% on the debt. Rounding up, Abigail. 
Yeah, well, the stock is really surging the best day since October of last year, man. Is this, of course, after they did post that better uh, number of subscribers than expected? But lots of good things happening here. So their monthly active users jumped 23% to 602 million. That's Spotify's second largest gain ever for the quarter. The company also is continuing to cut costs to become profitable. In December, they did lay off uh, 1,500 people, one of those many tech companies that seems to be doing that, as you've mentioned. They are also pairing back on their podcast expenses, allowing some of, in addition, their popular podcasts to go to other platforms to generate bigger audiences uh, and to generate some of that ad revenue. Despite being unprofitable, when I took a look at these shares into today, since the December 2022 low menace, this stock up more than 200 percent. Really pretty amazing, adding to those gains today. I just want to put it out there. I'm cheaper than Joe Rogan. I'm happy to. I'm happy to re-ink uh, a podcast in, instead of Joe Rogan if they want a little bit of company expenses. Abby, thank you very much. Uh, the stock is up 8% on Spotify. Let's stick with the earnings. Eli Lilly blowing past the estimates after a strong launch of their new weight loss drug and higher prices for their diabetes drugs. Simone Foxman has the division. Simone. Yeah, there were great expectations for Eli Lilly going into this fourth quarter report and Eli Lilly pretty much exceeding all of them. When you look through the major metrics here, earnings per share, 2.49 dollars uh, per share, an estimated $2.18, gross margin coming in better than expected, even revenue up 28% on a year-on-year -year basis. This was largely driven by uh, sales of those GLP-1 drugs like Munjaro, um, especially in the United States where revenue increased 39%. Diabetes treatment, Munjaro, this is the rival to Ozempic. It's used uh, widely as an off-label weight loss drug, outperforming its previous best-performing drug, Trulicity, for the very first time. This is also a GLP-1, and it seems to be cannibalizing sales. As you mentioned, though, Zepbound coming in hot after getting FDA approval in November as a weight loss drug, seeing $176 million in sales versus an estimated $141 million in sales. Uh, we're looking for an increase talk on the call at 10 a.m. Uh, about continued delays in production in a lot of these major GLP-1 drugs. City, though, saying that the overwhelming beat on Monjaro as well as Zepbound is validation of both demand and supply. And really, the only concern for them is 2032 when some of these drugs are going to be available in generic format. That is a long time away. And so these uh, earnings results injecting a lot of optimism into the shares this morning, up uh, now close to 3%. Manis. Simone, thank you very very much. Let's turn our attention to Hertz. The rental car company misses its estimates as it sells its fleet of Tesla EVs. Isabel Lee has more on the story. Have Hertz said why and how much they're selling? Hertz is definitely hurt by this and they're selling around 20 ta 20,000 Tesla EV vehicles, that's one third of their fleet. So it's really the offloading of Tesla that affected Hertz. The company reported an adjusted loss of $1.36 per share. That's lower than the 76 76 cents analyst estimates and this is also coming from a profit of $70 a quarter ago 70 cents rather and 50 cents a year ago and it's the decision to offload Tesla shares that pushed them deep in the red Hertz said that they lost money renting Tesla's out and as we know Tesla's had has been implementing a series of price cuts and more broadly there's just really a slowdown in EV vehicles and this is a big blow to Hertz because they're one of the companies that embraced the EV revolution and now they're kind of reversing and it's really hurting sentiment and hurting their shares. The company is now hitting a record low. It's lower now by 5%. Hertz reported quarterly revenue of 2.18 billion that's largely in line with analyst expectation and so far the stock has fallen 21% this year Manis. As well, thank you very much. Uh, more bad news there for Tesla uh, as well as Hertz. Peter Chia is of Academy Securities, possibly putting back on his economic outlook. This is what he's got to say to the market. I'm not convinced the economy is about to take off, but I'm reevaluating that urgently. Now, Peter, good morning. Good to see you. What are you reevaluating? Where's the sense of urgency? And how are you striking? Good morning. Good morning. I really thought we were going to head into a period of slowdown in the economy. It was going to be rolling throughout the country, through different industries. But all of a sudden, the jobs report was so strong last Friday. We've seen some other signals. And I always go back to the City Economic Surprise Index, and that has bounced significantly since the middle of January. And I kind of poo-pooed some of that. I could find reasons why maybe spending was overstated. 
various reasons, but I'm now trying to dig deeper. Could we actually avoid any sort of landing and really have this sort of trampoline effect? I don't see it, but I'm now worried about it. And it wasn't a worry for me as a you know, economic bear a week ago. I mean, that's a heck of a pivot in the space of a week. What would be a trampoline moment? Where would you just say, actually, I'm going to throw in the towel here. I'm, I, I, I just, I'm convinced now. I am absolutely convinced. You know, I think if jobs are really coming back as strong as they seem to be, if AI is really catching on, and not just people dabbling in AI or using AI, but actually demonstrating success, that yeah. they are getting a good cost benefit from using AI, then I think I have to throw in the towel on this bearish outlook. Um, you know, at the other end, you've seen some problems in commercial real estate. So there, there's offsetting, and I'm not there yet. But all of a sudden, you can see this potential for a real takeoff in the economy. I go back, I recommend everybody goes back and reads uh, Alan Greenspan's discussion. He wrote a paper, I can't quote all of it, uh, his discussion around the new paradigm, which is back in a period of time when we had the evolution of the internet, the democratization of the internet, what would that mean for efficiency, for productivity? I, and I think we're at, what, do, what, what, what does anybody care what I think? We're at some kind of an inflection point with productivity and technology. Peter, you mentioned the regional banks and, and commercial real estate. Last year, you were, you were bullish, not evangelist, you were bullish. You were recommending CRE and regional banks for much of last year. You cannot decide whether last week was idiosyncratic and a great buying opportunity or not. Again, what is it that would turn you from unsure to an assurity of going long? Right. So we had such a good run into last year, we kind of re recommended reducing exposure. Right now, we're seeing a few isolated events. I do think positives for commercial real estate, a lot of the big projects are well-funded. They're backed by big people who have plenty of money. The rates are higher, but they can get renegotiated. There's a lot of stability. I do think we're going to see 2024 as a return to work from the office. So that's going to be supportive of real estate. There are going to be individual cities and regions, I think, that struggle. So my only concern is, does this really hit the small, you know, the 10-unit um, multifamily thing and yeah. creep up from there? I don't think we do. So I'm getting positive, but I want to watch a little bit more data, get a little bit more anecdotal evidence that this is a small bank issue and not something that creeps into larger real estate and larger banks. Okay. Can, can we just step back for a moment and go back to where we started? You said, look, Manus, I'm ready to be convinced. I'm ready to act urgently and reconsider my position. If you look at the base case of no landing or quasi-soft landing, Ian Lingen is on the IB with me at the moment at BMO, and he's saying, listen, this is a 10 to 15% uplift in equity markets if that's what comes to pass, but you're not going to get an excess of 20% like you had late last year. So what kind of return in this quite holistic environment that you say you, you wait to be convinced of can be delivered in equities, and, and how does that transfer across assets? Yeah, I think it can be delivered in equities. And if all of a sudden the economy really is avoiding any landing and is starting to reaccelerate, if we start feeling the benefits of onshoring and reshoring, so there's better jobs domestically, you start getting these foundries ramped up, I think you could easily get above 20% if that's the theory. I think technology is going to lead the way probably for a little bit, but I think you're going to see a much more broad rally as producers do very well. I think the Russell 2000, the banking system. So I would want to own everything be heavily overweight, the non-big tech. I think commodities will do well. I think energy is going to be one of the great stories where we seem to finally be getting our act together and realizing if we want sustainable energy in the future, we have to build sustainable faster than we've been building it. But we also have to make sure we reinvest significantly for the next 10, 20 years in traditional energy. I think that's going to be huge for the commodity space and commodity-related um, stocks. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of torn here. I've got a quasi-European narrative, which is UBS share buybacks, BP share buybacks. I mean, Exxon and Chevron have also been gargantuan share buybacks. Um, maybe big oil trades at a valuation discount because of all of the headwinds of whether you want to own big oil. But when you see this buyback wave coming towards us at, in, in, in January during this earnings season, how important is that to portfolio construction? Certainly it helps, right? It, it says that they are going to you know, reward shareholders for the risk the shareholders have been taking. But I think all those companies you mentioned, right, they're all in the process of transitioning themselves from big oil to big energy. Mm. And I think that's what we really have to be thinking about is thinking of these companies as good at getting energy out of the earth, and that they happen to do it one way for decades, they're going to do it other ways. So that's why I like them so much. I think they've got the resources, the money, and the expertise to transition themselves. And that's where you're going to see that benefit, right? They will figure out how to maintain what we have 
grow to the future, they will all look very different 20 years from now, and you want to enjoy that ride, I think. Enjoy the ride. Well, certainly enjoy the enjoy the buybacks. I mean, the, it's amazing, isn't it? The differential between what Exxon and Chevron are doing relative to the size of the BPs of this world. Let's square it away. Since you lack conviction on what's going on with the regional banks, I just wonder what that means for credit. You know, I think credit as a whole is going to do fine. So large corporations have always depended on the larger banks and the public debt market. That's going great. And I think we've been highly recommending to our client base that they overweight corporate credit versus treasuries. I just think you're getting paid excess returns. You have less risk. A lot of the corporations are better governed than our own government. Right? They don't talk about not paying the debt. So I want to be overweight that. And I think private credit is stepping in for the smaller institutions. Yes, you're going to have to pay a little bit more as the banks are kind of you know, on their back foot, the small banks, they're not lending as much. Private credit is filling that gap reasonably well. So I think credit's going to do very well. It's going to be a success story. And if we're right again, we get this sort of rebound, you will see spread, credit spreads contract, and you could actually see some M&A activity, which would really help the high-yield market. Well, I leave you with this thought. Sometimes the shareholders can be more brutal uh, than the voters of a country. Uh, Peter Cheer, thank you very much. Peter Cheer of Academy Securities on his calls. Coming up, there are job cuts. They are continuing in the tech sector. Initial jobless claims never spiked up to a significant level, which just suggests that there is still demand for those kind of workers outside of tech or, or at different companies. That big conversation next on Bloomberg. Good morning. interesting thing about those tech job cuts is that it appears as if people who were laid off were able to get work rather quickly as we never saw a very weak non-farm payrolls print, for example, or initial jobless claims never spiked up to a significant level, which just suggests that there is still demand for those kind of workers outside of tech or, or at different companies. But it is important to watch if some of the, the weakness around the edges of the job market become more pernicious and actually Actually point to a weaker job market ahead. Cameron Dawson of New Age Wealth speaking to me yesterday. DocuSign kick off today announcing this morning they are laying off around 6% of their workforce. Spotify reports results this morning, another of those companies to make significant layoffs. Now the streaming service is cutting 17% of the workforce back in December. The company putting a uh, focus on increasing its revenue. Katie Greifel is with me this morning. Look, there, there's a myriad of estimates out there, but big tech is taking the knife out to jobs. Big time, and you're seeing that this morning. Let's start with the details on DocuSign there. Of course, this comes after the company is looking to cut costs after reports to try to sell itself. Apparently, those efforts have stalled. That is according to people familiar with the matter. As a result, DocuSign going to cut about 6% of its workforce. And like you mentioned, Manus, I mean, this is part of a growing trend. We heard from Snap just yesterday that it plans to reduce its workforce by about 10%. Earlier this month, we heard from Okta, similar plans there. And in December, like you said, Spotify announcing that it's cutting 17% of its workforce. And all told, estimates do vary, but 32,000 tech workers have lost their jobs already in 2024. That is, a da that is according to data from layoffs.fyi. And the bulk of that is coming from the big employers, think Amazon, Salesforce, and Meta. And the reasons why, they do vary by company, but the common denominator seems to be that this is a sector that really overhired during the pandemic. And as such, you're, trying to, you're seeing this industry still trying to right size coming out of that. And as a result, you're, that's why you're seeing these job cuts in certain departments. It is important to note that you're still seeing aggressive hiring in other departments. Actually, if you take a look at Comp TIA, there are about 33,000 active tech job postings in January. And that dynamic, that cost cuts, that refocusing is probably why you're seeing these companies get rewarded in the stock market. Okay, Katie, thank you very much. Certainly Spotify, look at that, up 8.8% this morning. That is Katie Greifeld. Well, the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is due to begin testifying at the House Financial Services Committee on the annual report of Financial Stability Oversight Council. Bloomberg's Mike McKee joins me now for that conversation. Um, Mike, 
what can we expect? I mean, we had the SLUs report yesterday. We've got uh, Bank Corp last week, New York Bank Corp last week. Where do you think this conversation is going to begin and end? It probably begins with Janet Yellen telling the committee that things are pretty good out there. The economy is in good shape. I'm sure she's going to echo the Fed chair at his news conference and then on 60 Minutes saying this is a good economy. Unemployment's still low and inflation is coming down and growth is still high. But then you'll have members of uh, the committee ask her about various things that could go wrong, and that's where some of these things like the banking system come into place. Uh, Yellen is going to tell the committee that the uh, government's uh, FSOC committee, uh, the Treasury Department, the Fed, uh, the Office of the Controller of the Currency have tightened regulations and have tightened supervision of banks, and they are much safer. They don't think that there's going to be any kind of systemic problem as there was with S. VB, but she's going to talk about the need to continue that and perhaps uh, have additional regulatory powers granted to those agencies to be able to stay on top of what's going on. Then, of course, you've got other things like climate change menace that'll be coming up. Uh, the regulators want to be able to consider climate change impacts, like if you're going to borrow money, is what you're borrowing money for going to end up underwater? or uh, in, in more than one way, <laughs> or, Quite literally. or, or, or uh, you know, uh, something like that. So uh, there's going to be a, a lot of political questions in there, as well as Yellen's description of the economy being pretty, pretty good. Look, she is ex-Fed. Um, there's there, there's going to be talk around rates. There's going to be talk around this economy and how strong it is as well. Given what Katie and I were just chatting about there, these are idiosyncratic job cuts, but there is a cumulative effect to these job cuts that are coming through on tech. Um, do you get a sense when you look at the data that we're going to get slightly hotter reads on jobless claims as these as these tech jobs they're piling up at the moment. We may get slightly higher uh, jobless claims. Uh, the question is then, do people get jobs fairly quickly in the AI that? switch? Perhaps it's really hard though to keep track because these are all. Uh, tech jobs, which basically means they're higher paid and people are going to get severance and they can't apply for jobless benefits until their severance runs out. So this could take a while to show up in the data. It's also not that many people on a national yep. basis, so it doesn't really show up in the data yet. It's just a question of whether it's a, a you know a, a canary in the in the sentiment coal mine uh, of the jobs market. Mike, thank you very much. That is Bloomberg's Mike McKee uh, with the very latest. Let's hear from Yellen a little bit later on. It's 9:51. She'll be on the tape uh, just after the top of the hour. Uh, some sector price action for you. Abigail Doolittle is with me as ever. Abby, what have we got? Well, we have a very small gain for the S&P 500, low volume relative to the composition, though it's extremely broad. Materials, the best rebounding from yesterday's big drop, up 1.4 percent. Then healthcare and real estate also up solidly. The rest of the sectors that are higher up less than four tenths of one percent. To the downside, you have tech down about four tenths of one percent. So not a lot of movement here. Let's take a look at what's happening on the year, though, because it is pretty interesting. We have not seen the diversification, the breadth that everybody wanted to see at the end of last year. The top two sectors, communication services up 10.5 percent, tech up seven percent. And then we have a number of sectors that are down on the year, including utilities and real estate. Well, they are both down more than five percent. So uh, this year's rally, it's certainly not coming from uh, non-tech, non-magnificent seven sectors, at least yet. Abby, thank you very much. Abigail Doolittle there. Coming up in the show, market moving events. That will set the agenda for you. What a beautiful day in New York City. Good morning. The sun is shining and stocks a bit. If you believe in the strength of the landing in the U.S. economy, maybe the dip that you've had in the Russell is an opportunity to go for breadth. Uh, the Nasdaq is just flat at the moment. There's an underbelly. Tesla is down. Spotify are cutting jobs. DocuSign are cutting jobs. So it's not that the unemployment scenario is running away with itself on the upside. Roll it over and have a look. You've got the beginning of a trifecta of bond auctions this week. Threes, tens, and thirties right at the very, very long end of the curve. Today, you're going to see three-year paper uh, in terms of the size there, how easily is that absorbed? You've got corporate issuance this week of about $30 billion. Ten-year government bond yields dipping back ever so slightly at 413. And then, of course, will you be able to absorb all of the supply at the longer end as we go towards the end of the week? Let me set you up with your trading diary. She votes. It is Ms. Mesta. She is the Cleveland Fed president, and she will speak at noon 
Eastern. More Fed speak throughout the day, Kashkari, Collins and Harker. So you have a quartet to digest. To Ford, uh, the earnings come after the bell rings this evening. Disney, a whole new world will turn in their report card uh, as well. Uh, that is tomorrow after the bell. Thursday, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen testifies to the Senate. And Friday, CPI revisions. I like a bit of Disney. That was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>